Dr. Uh, James Polano from uh, the Naples community um, and Naples uh, Community Health uh, will give us a presentation on some of the, the human models for our mouse diseases. Uh, Dr. Flano is a clinician, a cardiologist. Uh, he is the founder of, that was supposed to be a joke, but I think it's a joke. Dr. Tolano is the founder of the SWIFT Institute, and he will talk about the work that he's doing with, with patients and some of the exciting new fields that he's working in that promote wellness uh, through early detection and management of cardiovascular disease. Dr. Tolano, it's great to have you here. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, the Jackson Laboratories for putting, bringing to our community uh, such a tremendous uh, asset that we have. And the ability to work with NCH and the Jackson Laboratory, which is a tremendous asset for this community, to bring personalized medicine, which is the future in terms of genetic, genetics and genetic research, to our very own community. And I think we're, it's a great marriage tonight. Hope that it continues. Um, my job really today is, is to discuss really the, the um, relationship that we see between vitamin D and HDL. And so the first thing we'll do is, is discuss the role of vitamin D in cardiovascular health. And does it have a role, does it play a role in cardiovascular disease? We'll then we'll discuss the role of HDL in its reverse classical transport. And at the same time, then, to determine is there a biochemical or clinical synergy between vitamin D and HDL in preventing atherosclerosis? Is this just a neat association? Is this just something that's developed in the laboratory that you can see? Or is there a real relationship between the two? Well, the first thing is let's talk about vitamin D. Vitamin D is, is prevalent in our skins and our bodies. It's a 7-dioxy cholesterol or polycalciferol, which then is converted into what we call here as 125-dioxy um, cholesterol or calcitrol, calcitrol, which is vitamin B3. This is the active component of vitamin B3. This is inactive. Now, how is vitamin D found? Vitamin D is really prevalent in our skins and our in our body, and it develops. Um, from exposure to the sun, something we're not very used to here in Naples in the last several months. <laughs> but with the effects of the sun, it converts the inactive form of, of vitamin D into the active form. And from that, we should have normal vitamin D levels. However, it's been very obvious to us, those of us who measure vitamin D in our patients, that a good 50 to 60 percent of our elderly population, I don't say elderly, but above 65, are really vitamin D deficient. Surprisingly, in this community where we're exposed to the sun, people will come in with tan faces and skin and have low vitamin D levels. So there, it appears that there is an inability for our bodies to convert from the inactive form to the active form. And that may be the reason that we see such problems. Now, what is vitamin D is responsible for metabolism of phosphorus, calcium, bone metabolism, neuromuscular function, the functions of muscles and nerves. If we look in terms of the different type of syndromes that are associated with it, there's a list of symptoms here which require, which have as evidence, evidence A, or the highest level of association with the deficiency. So these are without a doubt the syndromes that are associated with low vitamin D. It's been proven. However, more important than that, there is level B and level C estimate that low vitamin D is associated with diabetes, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, weight gain, especially postmenopausal obesity. It's also been associated with multiple sclerosis, seasonal affective disorder, osteoporosis, renal osteodystrophy, and it also has a role in preventing colon cancer. And we see it with cancer prevention and colorectal cancer, specifically. But I bring your attention to this combination here of diabetes, high blood pressure, hyperpregnosis, and obesity. Because we're going to see where this is 
where we begin to see the association of HDL and vitamin D. Now, how does vitamin D respond to protection in cardiovascular disease? Well, we know that it inhibits vascular smooth muscle proliferation. The vascular smooth muscle proliferation is the type of proliferation that occurs when you have a plaque of blood vessels and develop a coating or the outer lining of this plaque. It also suppresses calcification, vascular calcification. The plaque that builds up generally goes on to calcify. Vitamin D prevents that calcification from occurring. It decreases inflammatory markers and it actually upregulates anti inflammatory markers. So it's an anti inflammatory type of vitamin. And it also has an effect on the endocrine renin angiotensin system. So it, it has a multitude of areas where it, it actually works on vascular. Now, I'm going to digress a moment and talk about lipids. For the time being, we're going to make you all lipidologists. Those are those of us here who are, in fact, um, the study of lipidology. And if we look in terms of the lipoprotein, there are three major lipoproteins, lipoprotein particles. Low density lipoprotein, or the LDL, which actually was described by Ron. The high density lipoprotein, which is really the focus of our attention today. And the very low density lipoproteins that are the very low VLDL lipoproteins that we see with elevated triglycerides. The lipoproteins predominantly carry the fats. And if we look in terms of cholesterol, cholesterol is carried by the low density lipoproteins, LDL, and cholesterol is also carried predominantly by HDL. The triglycerides, which are also a form of, of uh, lipids, are carried by the very low density lipoprotein, BLDL, and chylomicrons. We'll see how that works in terms of that. Now, what is the anti atherogenic effect of HDL? Is there a beneficial effect of HDL in terms of preventing atherogenesis? Well, again, as Ron pointed out, apolipoprotein A is a major protein of HDL. But, however, apoprotein E, a secondary protein that carries HDL, prevents amyloid deposits in the brain, and has a role, actually, in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So even though the difference carrying between apolipoprotein protein A and E are, can be related to different types of diseases and efficiency. Low HDL is an important predictor of cardiovascular risk. If there's anything in your blood analysis that, that points to cardiovascular risk, it's the low LDL, a low HDL. Its anti-epidemic effect really comes out from what was described as reverse cholesterol transport. It also has an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antioxidant. Again, very similar to what we saw with vitamin D. So you can see that there is a relationship between vitamin D and HDL. Now, this shows a relationship of cardiovascular disease based on your HDL. If your HDL is 35 or below, we see here that your chances of having a cardiovascular event in six years is almost 80. If your HDL at the time of onset is 35 to 55, or greater than 55, you can see that it drops to less than 30. So HDL by itself is a very, very strong predictor of disease. Well, what about LDL? LDL, the bad cholesterol that we're all familiar with, also has a relationship. The higher the LDL, the more likely we see here, the, uh, uh, the higher the LDL, irrespective of the HDL, the HDL that is lower has a much higher incidence at each successive level of LDL. So HDL in these lower ones here causes an increase in cardiovascular risk. This was really taken from the Framingham study when that really started. In fact, Dr. William Cannell, who is the, one of the authors and one of the originators of the Framingham study, said on the basis of multivariate statistical analysis, the protective effect of HDL appears to be greater than the atherogenic effect of LDL. And that becomes important, especially when you start looking at patients.